Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is the part two, I guess, in the repair series for this TRS-80 Model 3 motherboard I have that stumped me twice now at trying to fix. In this video though, I am extremely confident I'm gonna have this board up and running. And the reason why? I got some friends to help me and we created a diagnostic ROM for this machine to actually help in troubleshooting. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, first, a quick recap of what went wrong in the first video of me repairing this motherboard. I started out troubleshooting the basics, checking the data bus, address bus on the CPU, the reset, the clock, and the power. And then I went down the path of seeing if the ROMs were good, and I have the three original ROMs installed in this board. And I built this, a little adapter that allows me to use a regular EEPROM or EEPROM in place of this one, ROM A. ROM A is the ROM that sits at 0000, which is required to boot any Z80 machine or Z80 machine. Since making the first video, I understand a little bit more about how the ROMs work. There's a disassembly I found on the internet and it starts booting this ROM, but then very quickly hands off to ROM C, which handles the initialization of the video and starts getting the system ready for operation. Incidentally, on this particular motherboard, you can replace ROM C with a regular 2716 EEPROM, but for these two ROMs, you're gonna to need to use an adapter like this. And this adapter can work in either of these sockets though. Once I confirmed the ROMs were good, I went down this path of thinking the computer was actually booting. Oh, and I had RAM installed in it. I thought the computer was booting and I just couldn't see the activity on the video display. So that led me to this IC right here, which is used as part of the chip select logic for the board. Basically that chip is responsible for selecting the video circuitry, the keyboard, or some of the ROM chips. And I thought something was wrong with it, which is why this chip is now in a socket. The original chip is back in the board because there's actually nothing wrong with it. In the end, I didn't have a working motherboard and a few bad assumptions got me to that point where I really hadn't made much headway from the beginning of the video. So as I mentioned in the first video and I mentioned in the intro to this video, one thing I think would be really helpful is if I had a diagnostic ROM that I could install into this motherboard to give me some rudimentary activity on the system that I could know what to expect to help me look around for the problem. I think at least part of my issue in the first part was that the stock ROMs here in the motherboard do a bunch of bootstrap activities and I don't really fully understand that. So I'm not really sure where it was hanging up exactly. So a diagnostic ROM, which is a much simpler thing and a known quantity would allow me to do a better job at maybe figuring out what the issue is. So I reached out to Frank IZ8DWF and a local viewer, David, and I asked them to help me in creating a Z80 Model 3 and Model 1, because they're the same machine, diagnostic ROM. I had looked around and I could not find any mention of any diagnostic ROMs for this machine. There's a bunch of disk-based diagnostics, like once the system is booted, that you can then run to try to do further RAM tests or whatever, but there seemed to be nothing that could replace the standard ROM on this to run diagnostics. Now, of course, on the Commodore, like on the 64, we have the dead test cartridge, we have the regular diagnostic, and even for the PET, there's like the clip-on diagnostic ROM, which I've shown in some of my videos. Very, very helpful things. So taking a look at Notepad++, here is the diagnostic ROM that we came up with. And yes, it's written in Z80 assembly language. And of course, I'll be uploading this so anyone can uh, download the binary file or download the source. It'll be on GitHub. So people, please feel free to modify it and make it better. Let's run this brand new diagnostic ROM through the TRS-80 Model 3 emulator just to see how it's supposed to work. So I have TRS-32 set up to emulated Model 3. It has 48K of RAM and let's unpause this. Okay, first of all, you heard a beep, and there it was very quickly attested the video RAM, and notice he says VRAM, good, using the VRAMs for CPU stack. I'm just gonna pause this real quick. 
So I talked about this in the first part. The CPU needs some memory to use as a stack, which is basically a place for it to temporarily, well, for programs that are running to temporarily store registers and other information. You push onto the stack and you pop off the stack to basically temporarily store memory. And it's also used for subroutines where the CPU can jump to something and then return. It's pretty essential for normal operation. You can run code though, without a working stack. And actually the way the video RAM test is made on this thing is it actually can test all of video RAM on its own first without a working stack. And then when we look back here, notice it says VRAM good using the VRAM for CPU stack. And yes, I had an idea that we should just point the stack pointer to the video memory because the video memory on this, oh, there are the two chips, is actually a dedicated chunk of the address space. I think it's a 3C something or other. And basically it acts as normal memory to the CPU. The CPU can use it to store programs, but typically if you write into the video memory, you just display whatever you write on the screen, but you can read and write from that VRAM as if it were normal memory. So once we do a VRAM test, if the video RAM is good, then we know that we can store the stack there, which is then important because the further testing we do and also displaying messages on screen and stuff like that, it requires a working stack because there just aren't enough registers on the CPU, at least for our abilities to code around that. And when you look down here, see this little bit of garbage at the bottom, this is actually the stack being written to and pulled off of. And the way the stack works is it actually runs reverse direction from the memory location. So if you set the stack pointer to the top of memory, as you fill up the stack, stuff will fill up the screen this way. Anyhow, now that it knows the video RAM is good, it starts testing the DRAM. Now, unfortunately, it's hard coded for the amount of DRAM to test. And currently, as you can see here, it's testing 48K. What I'll do, I'll upload onto GitHub several different bin files for the different amounts of memory that you would get on a TRS-80, like 4K, 8K, 12K, 16K, 32K, and 48K. So just use the appropriate bin file on the machine that you have. If we wanted to try to get fancy, we could try to like read the keyboard to allow you to pick um, how much memory to test. But the problem is the keyboard part of the computer may not be working, so I'm hesitant to rely on stuff that hasn't been tested and may not work as a way to even run the diagnostic. So I figured just getting a different bin file might be the easiest thing to do. Anyways, okay, it's testing the DRAM and you see two things here that have been scrolling by. Now I pause this. The first is the page. Now a page on an 8-bit processor is the first byte of a memory address. So for instance, uh, 20, 20, hexadecimal, right? There are possible 256 memory locations inside of every page. That's just how it works. So this RAM test, as is most code runs on these types of processors, tests the RAM at 256 bytes at a time. So right now I pause it, it's on page 82 and it's filling up the memory with AA. Now looking in the source code, this is what it's doing when it's testing the memory. It's not the most advanced and believe me, um, there may be problems with certain types of memory issues that won't be detected. So again, this would be future enhancements to try to make this a little bit better. But it just starts out writing 00, zero then 55AAFF, and then it writes through these bits. And you might be asking, by the way, why 55 and why AA? Well, because when you write 55, it's an alternating byte pattern or bit pattern. I mean, 010101 and so on. And AA is the alternative where it's 101010 and so on. I might be mixing those two up. And incidentally, it went by pretty quickly on the video RAM test, but that also does something similar where it writes all these bits to memory first, then it writes AA55FF, and then it fills the screen with 20, which of course is the space character if everything is working properly. And that's at the end of a good successful pass of the video RAM test. So back to the emulator, if I resume, I hit pause, you can see this little going by and there it is doing its thing, testing all the pages. And there it is at the end, DRAM test good, have a nice day. And the system is halted at that point. Now for fun, let's switch this to, I don't know, a 4K machine and let's restart this. Okay, there's the power up beep and it should error out pretty quickly. There it is. Okay, DRAM problems found. You actually have 48K halted. Now the message that it prints is pretty simplistic where it's not actually telling you like, hey, you only have 16K. I just typed in that generic message there to say, maybe it's getting an error because you don't have all the memory using the wrong bin file. 
anyhow, let's talk about what it's showing here on screen. So it's printing out the page that was being tested. It's printing out the next byte here is what was being written. So it was writing zero, zero to the memory location. And then when it read it back, it was expecting to get zero, zero, but it actually got FF and now it says bad. And it actually continued testing. It didn't just abort right away and it went on from there. And I think it tests 40 more locations or 40 more pages actually before it fails. And yes, it's not telling you the exact memory address of the failed location, but generally you can figure out from the page number where it is on the motherboard, because this is bank zero, first 16K, the next one and the next one. So if it's failing in the upper ranges, like say at 44K, it's gonna give you a page address like around DE or something like that, which you look at the schematics, you can figure out that this part of the memory here is that part of the RAM. In addition, because it shows you what it wrote and then what it got back, that might be able to tell you where the bit error is. So if it wrote zero, zero and it got zero, one back, then that right away tells you that it's bit zero. That is the problem. That first RAM chip gave the wrong value. Now, one thing I didn't mention is the audio prompting. The reason why it does it, and it also does it if the video RAM tests bad, is because if you have a non-working video subsystem on your computer, you might not even know that it's operating. But that beep, which comes out of the cassette port, so it's pretty trivial to hook up a speaker to it, can tell you that the system is initialized and actually running. Now, of course, it's totally possible that you'll get that initial beep, and then the system fails in some way and you never get another beep. But at least the fact that you hear a beep can give you a big clue to know that the system is executing the ROM code. And that, to me, is really important because obviously in part one, you saw how much I was struggling with, is the system actually executing any code, yes or no? Well, that for sure tells you that it is. And you have to have like a working CPU and some other chip select logic needs to be working for the ROMs to be working for it to even make that beep. And incidentally, on this machine and the Model 1, to make a beep out of the cassette port, you have to write to an I.O. register. Also, to change it between 32 columns and 64 columns, you have to write to an I.O. register. So that's some more of the computer that needs to be working. Some more logic in there needs to work to get a beep or to switch between 40 and 80 columns or 32 and 64, sorry. Okay, I've done enough talking. I have the adapter here and I have the ROM is burned onto this chip here which incidentally is a 2864. And that was very helpful for troubleshooting because I have run it on this machine just during our testing, just to see if it, if it actually worked on real hardware. Because this is literally the first time that this version of the code will be run on real hardware. But yeah, this adapter, which was initially designed for 27128, actually works perfectly with 2764s and the EEPROM version of the 2764. So I didn't have to go use the UV eraser every time I needed to update this thing. I just took the chip off, stick it in the Mini Pro and updated it. Very handy. All right, before I install this, let's just make sure the machine is working, well, working to the same point it was at when we left off on part one. I haven't done anything further to it. Okay, I think we're good to go. I'm gonna plug this in. Okay, there we go. I heard a little click out of the relay here, which is sort of what it does when it sometimes is crashing. If I hit reset, yeah, we get a little bit of a flash on the screen, but. Okay, so we are in exactly the same situation we were in before. So I'll pull the power cord out of the wall. Let's swap out this ROM. I'm gonna leave these other two ROMs in here because, you know, why not? And there we go, in with the diagnostic ROM. And okay, I'm gonna hook up my speakers so I have some clip leads right here. So I'm gonna plug the ground into this little wire here that comes from the RF shield. And right here, and I know this is gonna be hard to see on camera, let me uh, unplug the keyboard. This is the cassette port connector and the output pin is pin one, or I don't know if it's pin one or not, but it's the pin that faces the keyboard connector. So if you're hooking up a motherboard like I am directly to speakers without using the original cable, it is the pin closest to the keyboard connector or towards the top of the motherboard. What I'm hoping that this ROM shows us is that the system is able to execute code off the ROM and then it'll be able to tell me if the video RAM circuitry is actually working properly. So my hunch was in the first video that the CPU couldn't even talk to the video RAM circuitry at all. And that was one of the problems. So we'll find that out pretty quickly with this diagnostic ROM. Okay, so I have the speakers turned on there behind the camera there, and I'm going to plug in the computer. There's the beep. Okay. Okay, here it goes. You heard the tone. Okay, so that is saying 
that it has detected right away, it's detected a video memory problem. That was that second tone very quickly. So let's talk about what we're looking at on screen here. You notice there's a whole pattern of all the letters and numbers, right? That was actually a routine that Frank wrote at the very beginning, like the early stages of this ROM. And I just wanted to see if a ROM could write anything to video memory. And when you look at it, well, it kind of looks okay, but it's not okay, actually. And you know what? This one thing here reveals a lot, which is excellent. Okay, take a look at this. I grabbed a screenshot of the capture from this real machine, what we were seeing on it. And on the emulator here, I paused it on the diagnostic at the very initial stage of the video RAM test. So we can compare the way it's supposed to look compared to how it's looking on this system. So right away, you can see here that something is wrong. Look at the second line here, H-I-J-K-L-M-N, and then it repeats. It goes back to H-I-J-K. Meanwhile, the way it should be looking, it starts with an at symbol, then you get the whole alphabet as normal. And this repeating pattern kind of repeats all the way through. So that's one problem I can notice right away, but there's another issue too. Take a look here on the real one. Do you see all the graphic characters? And of course on the TRS-80s, that's how it creates graphics. It's like a text mode thing, but it's decent. It's actually, you can get some pretty nice looking graphics out of this old machine from 1977. On the Model 3, you have the graphics character set, and then you have another set with just like extra characters, you know, like Greek characters and stuff like that. Well, notice on this machine, we're not even getting that at all. We are getting the same stuff as the first two lines repeating over and over again. So that is the second problem. Here's a conversion chart for all ASCII characters and their binary equivalents. And the TRS-80 Model 3 is an ASCII-based machine. So let's take a look at the first problem. So we're expecting a letter A, we're getting the letter I on this machine. And when we go to the ASCII chart, you can see the letter A with its binary value. And when you go to the letter I, you can see its binary value. You notice what's wrong here? Well, the binary value is exactly the same, except I has an extra bit turned on. And the same goes for H and the at symbol. It's the only difference is that extra one. And sure enough, the at symbol is an H on this machine. So that gives you immediately a clue that this bit right here, which is bit three, is stuck on. And the way you count up the bits is you start on the right and that's bit zero, and this would be bit seven on the left. So it's zero, one, two, three. So I'm gonna just write here, bit three stuck on. And the other problem I already mentioned is that it seems that none of these high characters are working at all. Like it just sort of repeats the lower. And that right away tells you that is bit seven that is stuck off. Now, you wouldn't notice that necessarily if this machine actually booted into an operating system or basic, but then when you tried to print one of those graphic characters, you would just get like one of the lower characters instead because of that bit that's stuck at zero. So that's bit seven is off. Now, I remember in the first video, I had done some checking to see if this side of this sketchy ribbon cable made its way over to this side of the motherboard. And this um, 74LS645 in this case, because the original one's back in, um, I had just checked for continuity. But when I checked the data bus activity on the machine, I only checked it on the CPU and around the CPU. I didn't check it over here. And that right away is one of my fundamental gaffes that I made with my troubleshooting process on this motherboard. On machines like the Commodore 64, there are no bus drivers on anything. Basically, the eight data bits on the CPU go to all of the various chips on the motherboard. They go to the RAM, they go to the ROMs, they go to the cartridge slot, they're like on the SID, they're, they're all over the place. So usually if you check the CPU, you can tell if there's a problem with any of those chips trashing the bus, like bus conflicts where two chips are trying to write at the same time will be manifested that way. I did not check what was on this side of the buffer chip. All right, for reference, I'm gonna bring up the TRS-80 Model 3 service manual here. Let's find the schematic section and check out how it looks over here on this video RAM side of the motherboard. Okay, so let's start with this E80 processor. Now, if we look down here, there's the data bus. Now, notice this, PD0 through 7. That's probably processor data bus. And it kind of goes off the bottom. Now, incidentally, that comes up uh, right here, PD0 through 7. And you notice what's on there is the ROM chips. So the ROM chips appear to be connected directly to the CPU with no buffering at all. 
Next up, you see that there is a buffer chip here, which I guess is this chip right here. It says LS245 on the schematic. And when we scroll over here, it goes to just data bus connector. Now, a few pages down, there's the data bus connection there, D0 through 7. And what is showing here, these dotted lines are the two ribbon cables. So the one that's up there and then this one here. And it goes to D0A through 7. Notice the order is a little unusual, but that's weirdly the way it is. And there's also D0 through D7B. And here we are on the video circuitry page, and this is the buffer chip up here. And notice it is the A data bus, which happens to be this one. It, it does say on that other page, I didn't point it out, it has like J1 or J2 or whatever it is, and it does match this little ribbon cable down here. So that basically tells us it goes from the CPU to this buffer chip, through this ribbon cable, over here to this side of the board, to this buffer chip right here, because that is U67, and then to the video circuitry. Now, unfortunately, the A data bus set is not just for the video circuitry. It's for a bunch of other things on that side of the board. Case in point, we look at the schematic here. This is the keyboard matrix. It uses addressing lines on the left and then data bus on the bottom here. And look at that. It's hooked up to the A bus as well. So it is being buffered, though, by this LS240 onto the data bus. And it's going to be one of these chips probably right over here. All right, so that's the theory. Let's grab the oscilloscope and find out where those bits are actually stuck. All right, let's start here on pin two on this IC just to see what it looks like when everything is working properly because we know that one is not stuck. Okay, and there we are, we're seeing activity. Now let me hit the reset button. And there it is testing the video RAM, right? And it's, it's failing. But we see lots of activity going up and down Sorry, it's loud there. So we know that's how it should look on all of these bits. All right, so I just moved over to pin five. Take a look, it's stuck. Let's hit reset. Yep, that is stuck. That is very stuck. And we are stuck on this side. So the DA side, that's the side that faces the ribbon cable and the other stuff on this board here. All right, actually, before I do anything else, let's check pin nine which is data bit seven. And look at that, when I hit reset, that is stuck to ground. So that's the other one. Okay, both of those pins are stuck on the side that faces the ribbon cable and the other peripherals. Now, just for fun, I'm gonna pull out the power and I'm just gonna remove the ribbon cable. So that's actually disconnecting the whole CPU side from the video and the other components over here. When I power this back up, I don't expect to hear a beep because I bet you the cassette port is also hooked up to that side of the ribbon cable and there's definitely not gonna be any video or anything like that. It's pretty much not gonna do anything. Um, and yeah, we got no sound, no nothing. But I bet you the processor is trying to run right now. It's just failing on the RAM, the RAM test, the video RAM test, because of course it's not even there. Okay, so looking on this chip here now, the, the lines are just kind of high. They all look like they're high. So that's not gonna help us really because the one that's stuck high is stuck high. I'm gonna pull out this 245. I'm just gonna use the socket that's here as a way to access the data bus very easily because I know that it's over on the left side here that's going to all these different components. So it'd be really nice in the schematics if there was something to tell me where everything is that uses the data bus A. Because as we saw in part one, sometimes I'm searching around for things and I miss them even when they're in plain sight. So that's not great. One thing I can rule out for sure is that the RAM is actually on a different data bus and here are its bus transceivers. And notice it just says D7 whatever. So that is on the other side of this chip right here on the motherboard. It's completely unrelated to this stuff over here. I have grabbed a marker and I'm just going to start marking up any chips that I can see that are on the bus. So right away I know that this one here, what is this here? This LS240, which is U66 for the keyboard. This I see right here, so I'm going to draw an X on it. That doesn't mean it's bad, that just means that I need to look at it some more. And then looking at the cassette port, definitely this does seem to be using A as well, although like it's only using one and zero here, which are both fine. And here it is one and zero again. So it's almost like the cassette interface is literally transferring its data over just those two bits and nothing else. The rest are ignored. Honestly, an ideal situation would be that there's nothing else using the bus except for that keyboard chip, the LS240. And then that is the bad chip. 
Oh, I spoke too soon. U98 is on D3A, but not D7. I think that's D3A as well. And that is uh, is also this LS244. I mean, I'm gonna mark these, but to be honest, the fact that three and seven are bad, it's probably the same chip that's bad on both of those. I would have a hard time believing that like this LS244 here, which is only on three, and not seven is actually causing the problem and some other chip is causing the seven problem. All right, here are more chips that use, uh, that are on all of the bits here. So D7A, D3A, the printer port 244, so U95. So it's this chip down here, I'm gonna draw an X. And also U94, I'm gonna draw an X on that one as well. And then we have U101 that also appears to be on the A bus as well, a 245. Oh, you know what? That's this chip right here. So that's easy. I can just take that out. And I think we are at the end of possible chips here. It's just talking about these interface connectors up at the top here, which are on the data bus B. And yeah, that's it. Okay, so we have narrowed it down to these three chips as the likely candidates, these two are possible because they are on bit three, but not on seven. So it's really just one of these three here. All right, so I powered up the machine and um, you know, with this IC out here, I just wanted to check to see if anything's changed. And you know what? It has. Seven is not low anymore. It was definitely low before. So power it off and I'm gonna put the CPU back in. Let's see what it does. And I'll put back in the uh, 645 here, like that. And actually, I'm gonna leave this ribbon cable off for now. Let's power this back up. And let's check for that low on pin seven here, or data line seven. No, it's not. Huh, okay, let's uh, plug the ribbon back in and let's see what the diagnostic does. I'm gonna try it without this buffer in here. Let's see what we see. Oh, it definitely looks messed up. Now this line here is low again. Oh crap. Uh, I just noticed something. I plugged the CPU in backwards. That might have damaged it. Darn it. Luckily I have another Z80, but that, that's painful to damage a potential <laughs> good part there. Let's see if this works now. Look at that, it's, that CPU is working. Okay, the video RAM is unhappy. Let's check that pin here. Nope, that is stuck low. Could it just be this chip right here? Oh, ridiculous, if it's, if it's one of the socketed chips. Let's pop this one out. Okay. Okay, no, it's still low. <laughs> I'm like totally confused. Let me pull this ribbon cable out while it's running. Okay, so as soon as I pulled this out, that line went high. Is the problem with this ribbon cable? It's janky, but it doesn't look shorted and there's no ground on this, so I don't, I mean, maybe the problem exists Wow, okay, so hold on a second. Maybe the whole problem exists on the CPU side of things. Okay, so we're looking for the CPU side, which is right here, that is JP2A, and we're looking for pin six, which I'm assuming is one is the top. Yeah, there's a one there. So let's see what we see on pin six. Okay, I can't get the oscilloscope probe in there because that connector is made for these like really thin connectors here. So these little connectors here, these are pretty good. They shouldn't damage uh, the thing on the motherboard. I guess worst case, if it does, I'll just solder onto it because it's already tr trashed. All right, here we go again. So it is pin six for data bus line seven. Okay, I'm on six, let's plug it in. Yeah, okay, look at that. So the problem is existing on that side. What about for the other one? Let's see, uh, line three. So that's pin four. Okay, so pin four is fine, actually. Well, so that complicates things. So that means we have two separate problems. Data line seven is screwed up over on the CPU side, 
and data line six or three, I mean, is something over here. And that does mean that these two chips here, which I put question marks on, which are on data line three, are in play for this particular problem. Okay, back on the schematics. So we're looking for the non-AE side of the data bus, which is everything over here. And we know it's coming out of this chip, which I know I've already taken out and tested it. It's kind of warm, but I've swapped them out and stuff. So I know it's not that chip. The problem has got to exist something on this data bus. So remember, this is just the normal D data bus, no letter, which as I had mentioned earlier, the only thing I think that's on there is this RAM stuff here. So there's data line seven coming from, what is this, U63, which is this I see right here. I've looked around through the rest of the schematics and I don't think I see anything else on there. There's basically the bus transceiver right here and that chip, that's it. That pretty much confirms that that chip, that's a bad chip right there. And what's really, really annoying, now that I look at it, that appears to be an 8T26, which is like a very old school bus transceiver. And do I have any of those spares? No, none. So I'm gonna have to pull that out and bodge in something. I think a 74LS240 is similar. Like you gotta, it's obviously not the same footprint at all, but with a, an adapter, I could probably build a little tower that, that makes it work, I guess. But pulling that out um, should alleviate at least bit seven but we still have to find bit three. So I'm gonna pull that chip out and let's see if that makes the problem go away. Well, I just realized that all that footage I had just done, I recorded without the microphone being plugged into the camera. So unfortunately, all the audio you will have just heard is from the camera above my desk, which records like crap. So sorry about the terrible sound quality. I'm gonna do what I can to try to fix that in post-production but I don't think I can really go back and re-record all of that. Anyhow, there is the chip that I took out. There is the socket that's in there. Why don't we power this up and just make sure that that particular fault has gone away. All right, I'm on pin six right here. Let's power this up and there we go. That looks totally normal now. Sweet. So I'm just gonna put this ribbon back in. These two ICs are here, that one is still out. Let's see if that fixes the problem with line seven. I mean, it's possible that line three was affected. I don't think so. And actually look at the schematic here, four, five, six, and seven were all that were on this chip. So clearly that was not the problem. Let's plug it in. Okay. So it looks different. Now it's just all A's. Um, let me hit the reset. It's, why is it not even clearing the screen? It's so weird. I don't even, what? Oh, I'm like, of course we're not seeing, I was, sorry about the beeping. I was expecting to get those characters, but we're not because the buffer chip is out, right? I took out the buffer on the video circuitry. So let's replace this. All right, here we go again. There it is. Okay, so I I'm holding the reset button to pause it. Okay, look at that. Okay, we're getting, <laughs> okay, cool. So definitely that chip fixed the problem with the bit seven. We can visually just see that we have all the high characters now, but definitely bit three is still stuck because we still have the repeating characters. It starts with an HIJ as opposed to an at symbol ABC. We have not fixed that problem. We Well, we fixed one problem, oh well, fixed is not the right word. I figured out one of the problems because I don't have a spare one of these, but clearly we have another one. Now, the funny thing is the fact that, I'm gonna let go of the button there. The fact that this chip, sorry. The fact that this chip was bad tells us also something else. This is used to interface the DRAM, all of the DRAM to the processor. And remember how in part one, the computer was just acting weird and inconsistent. Like when I was resetting it, I'd see different things happening. Now in hindsight, I have a feeling that this chip was causing that problem too. I never went and checked the data bus going to the RAM chips. I only ever checked it on the processor, right? And this chip here is not connected directly to the processor bus, which I mean, it could easily be for whatever reason, it's connected on the other side of this bus transceiver right here. I don't know why they did it that way. There would have been no problem hooking this directly up to the processor bus as well, but they did decide to not do that for whatever reason. 
I should put this back in and we should look at the data bus lines on the RAM and see what they look like. Because, you know, to be honest, this is the hindsight part and my fundamental problems with my troubleshooting techniques. I should have actually checked the data bus lines on all of those RAM sockets. I mean, they're right there. They're really easy to test. Uh, it's pin two on all of them. I should have looked at that early on and that would have potentially indicated any kind of stuck bits or whatever. So I'm putting that chip back in that we know is gonna cause issues. And we'll power this back up. On the video, we have lost the high bit, so it's definitely messed up. And I have the scope up. Let's just go to pin two. So um, I don't know what bit this is, but that bit is not working. Is that bit seven? That might be bit seven. All right, so we know data bit seven was being screwed up by that particular transceiver, right? And that goes to nine and 11. And pin two is on U43, U25, and U7. And I can't really see the markings on the RAM, except I can see here, like this is 14. So that's gonna be seven on this side, uh, which means that absolutely this row right here is bit seven, which makes sense. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And let's just check that again. And indeed it's just, All right, um, there's something weird happening right now. I swear a second ago, it was stuck, bit seven. But now I'm on here and there's activity on bit seven. And this chip, it's in there. So let's change over to the video capture. And there it is, we actually have bit seven back. I'm almost thinking that this chip was bad and me heating it up kind of fixed it. I mean, definitely a second ago, I just put it on bit seven or bit uh, pin two here on bit seven. And here we are on the DRAM and there's definitely activity there. And a second ago, that was just stuck high. So yeah, this chip just came good and it's really hot. Oh, they're both hot. Okay, so I guess that's just normal. Let's just check the other ones. That looks normal. That's totally normal. That's good. That's good, that's good as well. That's good, and that's good. Okay, so all the data bits on the RAM are bad. <laughs> it just fixed itself, but I tell you, a second ago, I mean, I'm not, I wasn't on the wrong pin, I was on pin two, and it was definitely stuck high, and I was hitting the reset button, and it wasn't working. And we definitely saw the video capture, the high bits was missing, because all the graphic characters were not there. So that chip literally just fixed itself. And let's just see if it unfixes itself. No, it's fixed now. All right, so I mean, the bit three problem still exists, but the bit seven one fixed. Okay, well, I heated up that chip quite a bit by removing it with the um, hot air workstation there because I desolder the on the underside and then I use the hot air to take it out safely. And sometimes that heating up process can rebond things or whatever was wrong inside that chip. All right, well, to move on, I'm just gonna definitely mark um, an X on this chip. So I'm gonna leave it in there now because I don't have a, a replacement anyways. But because I know it's a flaky chip, I'm not gonna trust it. So I just need to order some spares. But for now, because it's working, we can proceed with the troubleshooting. All right, so how do I figure out which one of these five chips is causing that problem um, with bit three? Okay, so. Bit three, that's the one that's stuck at high, which kind of sucks because if it was stuck low, one way I might try to figure out what chip it is, because I know it's one of these five chips, is I would just inject five volts into that pin, like removing the ribbon cable here, and just put five volts with a lot of current and see which one of these chips heats up the most. But that's a little bit harder to do with it stuck high, but, I think I'm gonna still take a brute force approach and I'm literally just gonna take this chip here, the one for the video circuitry out, and I'm gonna short that pin to ground. And we're just gonna see which one of these chips heats up because it's gonna have to dissipate all that current of the short circuit basically through the chip. Now it may not be like the ideal way to do it, but I'm gonna try it. Never done before, at least by me. I don't know what this is gonna do. Let's see what happens. Already have the oscilloscope connected to pin five so we can keep an eye on it. And it's just, of course, stuck it at uh, five volts. The system is powered on. I'm gonna grab a box of resistors here. I'm not gonna be a total jerk and just go right for a short circuit. Let me pick a really 
low resistance here first. And it seems like the lowest I have is 10 ohms, which is uh, not that low actually. So we'll plug this into pin 10, which is ground. And let's bend this over and see what happens. All right, well that actually is grounding it. So let's see if any of these chips are warming up. Mm, none are really warm. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the voltage across that resistor. I'm gonna use the multimeter here. We'll see what the uh, drop is. So we can kind of get an idea of how much current is actually going through this resistor. Okay, well, it's only 0.0148 volts. So very little current is actually being dropped there. Is the problem maybe this ribbon cable or wherever it is, here it is. Maybe, maybe this thing is just barely connected on pin three. Like it has continuity when I go across this, but maybe the corrosion, there's so much corrosion here that when the bus transceiver that's over here by the CPU tries to drive that line down, they're down there's obviously like pull-up resistors over here that keep that part of the bus at five volts, that maybe this is so crappy, it can't even counteract against that small amount of um, whatever the pull-up is, 4.7 probably. One way for me to test that is to just use a new piece of wire across between these two connectors where the ribbon cable was. So I'm, so let's just reconnect this. The computer is actually on right now. Wait a second. Wait a second. We have, we have activity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna build up a connection here. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna build a new replacement ribbon cable which is what I talked about doing initially at the very beginning of the series here. I'm gonna use these jumper links though. And let's see, <laughs> let's see if that fixes things. All righty, I have the little thing done here. Let's zoom up on it a little bit. You can see there, it's just little bodge wires. Now they're not soldered onto the motherboard. They do come out, they're in little pin header things that are stuck in there. So because I just love being disappointed, I'm gonna put on the HDMI capture. Yes, we're gonna plug this back in, here we go. Look at that. It's freaking working. It's freaking working. Oh, I can't even believe it. So the whole time. Okay, well, it's giving us a RAM error because I only have 16K in there. This ribbon cable, I tested continuity across the entire thing and it was zero, ohm, you know, whatever, close to zero ohms on every trace, but obviously under any kind of load, that, that didn't work. <laughs> so all that chasing of problems. And then of course this chip here, which was bad and has come good. And I mean, at this <laughs> okay. Let me install the RAM in here. So it's 48K and let's see if this diagnostic test passes. I kinda can't believe it. I, I really, I really can't believe it that it's, that it's totally working. So, okay. In with the RAM, in with the RAM. Okay, RAM is fully populated. Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, here we go. There is the RAM test or the video RAM test. And look at that, VRAM is good. Now you notice it a little bit of like static on the edge of the, the left edge, totally normal for the Model 3 motherboard. They all do that. Has to do with the blanking or whatever of the line, or I don't know. Uh, I noticed that my, my working machine has that exact same symptom. So I don't think that's a problem. So far, so good on the DRAM test. I mean, I'm glad that I didn't have to cut any lines or anything. Look at that. DRAM is good. Oh, so if I hit reset, it's gonna run the test again. I need to change that initial beep. That's too rude sounding, maybe something shorter. Um, I think if I take the original ROM and put this back in, that this computer works. Okay, original ROM is in. Let's just make sure that this thing does boot. There it is, CAS, the CAS. I don't even know if this keyboard works. I never tested it, but there it is. This, oops, keyboard is dirty. And it does seem to type properly. <laughs> it's fixed. So when I originally had problems with this motherboard, 
I know that it's possible that some of the problems were caused by that ribbon cable, but I don't think so because this computer, when you turned it on from the very beginning, always had garbage. But I'm almost positive that one bad signal on the ribbon cable here would not cause the computer to not boot at all. Let's give that a try. I'm just gonna desolder that one wire to kind of simulate that bit three being stuck over here. I have a feeling the computer's still gonna boot into basic and everything's gonna work. Keyboard's not gonna work properly though, and we'll see the screen kind of corrupted. But yeah, I think it's still gonna try to boot. Okay, there we go. I've disconnected the one uh, that's bit three. And let's power this back up again. So look at that. So what's happening there, it's the cast prompt, but because that line is floating, it's trying to read the keyboard, which is what's going on. But you see there's like a flashing cursor. And obviously instead of a spaces clearing the screen, we have those um, parentheses. But for sure the system is booted. And if the only fault was this ribbon cable, the computer would have been like this, not with the garbage screen. Without a doubt, it's this chip right here that has come good that caused the initial fault with this machine. And maybe that ribbon cable wasn't so bad originally, I don't know. Anyhow, that is gonna be it for this video. Very long video, I think. I'm just in my head, I have a timer of how long I've been down here working on it. Hopefully I can edit this down into something that makes sense. But the machine is working. In the end, I replaced a chip I shouldn't have. Well, I socketed a chip that I shouldn't have. I had to make a new ribbon cable. And the bad chip here, the transceiver, came good. Why that is? Heat, I guess. But the machine works. And in the process, me and a couple friends came up with a diagnostic ROM that will hopefully help other people with TRS-80, Model 3s, and maybe Model 1s, if your machine is compatible, fix your machine. Because I have to tell you, for me, just seeing that screen where I could see the repeating patterns, I could right away tell that it didn't look right. And there were some, there were lines that were stuck high or low. And that was an immediate like trigger for me to get me to find those lines. I wish I had done that sooner. The moral of the story is look at the schematics and figure out where the bus transceivers are and make sure you test the data lines and potentially the address lines that are buffered and don't just do it on the CPU like I did. Honestly, this would have been a one part video if I had just done that from the start, but I wouldn't have made a diagnostic ROM. So I guess there's something good to come out of this. Anyhow, I hope you liked this video. If you did, thumbs up. Sorry about the bad audio at the beginning of the video. The cable was just hanging out of the camera. It was like right there. I was looking at the camera and I should have noticed it, but anyways, didn't notice it. So that's it. Thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you hated it. Comment down below. Second channel, please. Patrons, thanks very much. All the usual stuff. And that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.